Welcome to chapter 14, uh, our lesson on selectors. Okay, so let's uh, begin with defining what a multiplexer is, or MUX in short. A MUX is a gate, uh, here is a depiction, with uh, three inputs. It's a combinational gate with three inputs. The inputs are called D0, D1, and S. Here we have D0, D1, and S. S is a select input and D0 and D1 are data bits. D0 is fed to a special port of the MUX, which is called the zero data, and uh, D1 is fed to the one data. Very good. Now, uh, the functionality of the MUX is that Y equals D0 if S is zero, and it equals D1 if S is one, then we just choose S1. Okay, so Y equals always one of the two inputs, either D0 or D1, depending on the value of S, and therefore the multiplexer actually selects one of the inputs as the output. A shorter way of uh, writing this phrase would be to simply write Y equals D of S, because if S equals 0, then Y equals D0, and if S equals 1, then Y equals D1. Um, now we want to extend the definition of a multiplexer to inputs, data inputs of n bits. We call this an n bit selector, and we call this circuit an n to one multiplexer or n to one mux. Again, it's a combinational circuit, and it's defined as follows. It has n bits of data input, here we see them, and it has k bits of select input, where k equals log of n. And to simplify the discussion, let's assume that n is a power of two, namely that n equals two to the power of k. So this k that you see over here is simply log n. So this s controls uh, which of the bits of the input, which of the n bits of the inputs are selected to be equal to the output. Okay, so the output is a single bit. Here we have n bits of input, k bits of input, and a single bit of output denoted by y. And y is simply the bit in the input whose index is represented by s in binary re representation. Let's see an example. Let's choose n equals 4 and our data input d from th 3 to 0 is 0, 1, 0, 1. So I want to emphasize this is position 0, this is position 1, 2, and 3. Now if s is two zeros, then we are interested in the bit in position 0, and therefore we output 1. If uh, s is 0, 1, then it represents the number 1, so we're interested in this bit in position 1, and therefore the output should be d1, which equals 0. Uh, we will now present an implementation of a n to 1 mux. We will present, in fact, two implementations. One is based on a uh, decoder, and the second one is tree-based. So let's look at the decoder-based n to 1 MOX. This is the circuit. Here is the data input. Here is the select input. We take the select input, which consists of k bits. We feed it to a decoder with k bits of input. Recall that a decoder of k bits of input has 2 to the power of k bits of output. We denote these bits by w. We take the vector w and the vector d. Recall that 2 to the k is n, so w and d have the same widths. And we feed them to a row of AND gates. Therefore, we perform an AND of di with wi to compute to obtain zi. Okay, We do that for every i, from 0 to 2 to the k minus 1. So the row of adders, uh, the row of AND gates outputs uh, z, and now we feed z to an OR tree with two to the k inputs and a single bit of output. Let's try to understand uh, why this design is correct. Okay, so recall the functionality of the decoder is that the output w is a vector of length two to the k such that wi equals one if and only if the input s represents the number i in binary representation. So this vector w is a, all zeros except for a single position in which you have a 1. Now you feed uh, w together with d, sorry, 
you feed a W together with D into this row of AND gates. So whenever the, uh, in the, cor the bit fed by W is a zero, the corresponding bit of Z will also be zero. So we see that ZI will be equal to zero if I does not equal S, because if I does not equal S, then WI is zero. And therefore, the corresponding AND gate is fed by a zero, and it outputs a zero. So this explains why ZI is zero if I does not equal S. Okay, what happens if I equals S? If I equals S, then we know that WI is one. If WI is one, then we do an AND of DI and one, and that equals DI. So ZI equals DI if I equals S. Now, we take this vector, which is all zeros except for in position S, it equals di, and di could be either 0 or 1. We feed it into an OR tree. The OR tree takes, computes the uh, OR of these 2 to the k bits, and the OR of these 2 to the k bits, all being zeros except for di, perhaps di could be either 0 or 1, will equal d in position s, right? This is di such that i equals s. So we know that y gives us d in position s, and this is exactly what we needed, and therefore the design is correct. Um, what about the cost of the design? Well, this design is uh, consists of three parts. The OR tree has a cost which is 2 to the power of k. This is a k, what is written here? Uh, the AND tree, also the, uh, the row of ANDs, also has a cost of 2 to the power of k, and the decoder, recall from the uh, chapter on decoders, has a cost of 2 to the power of k. So we sum up these three costs, we get 2 to the power of k, 2 to the power of k is n, and therefore the cost of the n to 1 mux is tet big theta of n, as required. What about delay? Again, let's analyze the delay of each component separately. The delay of the OR tree is k, the delay of the row of ANDs is 1, and the delay of the decoder is k. We sum these up, we get that the total delay is k, k is log n, and therefore the delay of the n to 1 mux is big theta of log n. Okay, we want to know whether this is asymptotically optimal or not, so we want to prove that the cost of the design that we just saw is asymptotically optimal and that its delay is also asymptotically optimal. Namely, you cannot do better. How do we prove this? Well, we prove that the cone of the Boolean function implemented by the n to 1 mux contains at least n elements, all the data inputs, and therefore, since the cone is so big, the cost has to be linear and the delay has to be logarithmic in any implementation of an n to 1 mux using a combinational circuit with ga gates of constant fanning. So all we need to do is to prove this claim because these two things are corollaries that follow from the claim. Okay, so how do we prove that the cone of the mux is uh, at least n? We want to show that all of the inputs i, all of the data inputs in positions i where i goes from 0 to n minus 1 are contained in the cone. For this purpose, we fix the select input, S, so that it represents the number i. This is the number, this is the bit location that we're trying to prove that belongs to the cone in the data input. Good. So now we consider the data input to be all zeros. Well, if we feed the data input to be all zeros, then clearly y is going to be zero. So this is y equals zero. But now we take the all zero string and we, let me just add a parenthesis here, very good. We take the all zero string and we flip the i-th bit. But when we flip the i-th bit, it turns from a zero into a one. S represents the number i, and therefore the output y will be d in position i. d in position i, after flipping it, becomes one. So the output in this case is one, and therefore i belongs to the cone of the output and therefore, this holds for every i from 0 to n minus 1, and hence the cone has cardinality at least n as required. Okay, let's see a second implementation of an n to 1 mux. This is a recursive design. The uh, base case for n equals 2 is simply a mux gate, so we proceed to the uh, uh, reduction step. 
In the reduction step, we take the uh, data input and we partition it into two halves, uh, what we like to call DL and DR, where DL is simply the uh, N over 2 least significant bits of T, and DR is the N over, T, N over 2 most significant bits of D. Now we, fed, we feed these N over 2 bits in parallel to muxes with parameters N over 2 to 1. These two muxes are, of course, designed recursively. We control both of these muxes by the same select input. These are k minus 1 bits of select. These are the uh, bits of the select input from position k minus 2 to position 0. So both of them feed these two muxes. Now we take the outputs. This is... Um, <coughs> Sorry, I have a confusion here. Let me fix it. This is L. This is R. If it's zero, you choose the R. Sorry about this. If it's one, you choose the L. <coughs> okay, sorry about it. Uh, good. Now I have my output YL and YR from my recursive designs. I feed them into a 2 to 1 mux. This is a standard multiplexer. And this multiplexer is controlled by SK minus 1. And this is the bit I output. So I claim that this is a correct n to one MUX design. Let's try to understand why. Well, let's see. What does D equal in the position which equals S? So we need to consider two cases. Either SK minus 1 is 0 or SK minus 1 is 1. We're looking at the most significant bit of the select input. So if, SA, if SK minus 1 is 0 then we're interested in a bit that is over here. Which bit are we interested? We're interested in the bit of dr, which is located in the position given by s prime, where s prime is the k minus 1 least significant bits of s. Okay, because the most significant bit of s in this case is simply 0. So we're interested in this bit, and this bit, by the induction hypothesis, equals yr, and yr is the bit which is selected as y, and therefore we're doing well in this case. Now let's consider the case that SK minus 1 is 1. If SK minus 1 is 1, then we're interested in a bit which is over here, in the upper half. Which bit are we interested in the upper half? We're interested in the bit whose index in DL is given by S prime again. Okay. So in this case, we take the bit YL. And by the induction hypothesis, YL is exactly this bit, and therefore we have chosen the right bit. And that concludes the proof. What about the cost? The cost of this design satisfies the following recurrence. If n equals 1, sorry, if n equals 2, then we have a single mux. So the cost is 1 unit, 1 mux. I'm ignoring the cost of a mux, calling it 1. And if uh, n is greater, then I have two invocations of the recursive uh, uh, the smaller mux of size n over 2, plus a single mux over here, so I get this recurrence, and the solution for this recurrence is linear, and therefore the cost of the n to 1 mux is linear. What about the delay? The delay of this n to 1 mux, of this tree-based n to 1 mux, satisfies the following recurrence, if n equals, if, sorry, this is n. If n equals 2, then the delay is 1, because you have to go through a single mux. And if n is greater than 2, then you have to go either through here or through here. It has the same delay. This is the delay you see over here. Notice that the leading constant is a 1. And to that, you add a 1, which is the delay of this mux. The solution to this recurrence is log n, and therefore the delay of the n to 1 mux is big theta of log n. We see that the asymptotic delay and the asymptotic cost of the tree-based MUX and the decoder-based MUX are the same. Both are asymptotically optimal. Okay, so we have two implementations, both of which are asymptotically optimal with respect to both cost and delay. Um, well, 
What is the actual cost of uh, MUX compared to the actual cost of AND gates and whatever you're using in your decoder, which is again AND gates, yeah? So here you have OR gates, AND gates, and inside the decoder you also have uh, AND gates. So what is the relative cost of the uh, two designs? Well, it depends on the actual uh, cost and delay of the gates you get. This will affect the actual constants in the both the cost and in the delay, but uh, we are not so sensitive to this. And in fact, it's uh, very hard to tell. It's, it's a technology-dependent thing. For example, in CMOS, the fast and cheap implementations of MUX gates are called pass transistors, and pass transistors have some um, undesirable properties, namely they do not restore the signals well. By restoring, I mean that um, a, uh, you input something which is uh, very cl it's close to zero, but not that close to zero, and you want the output to be very close to zero. And the same thing holds for high signals. <coughs> Recall the chapter on the four thresholds of uh, V low in, V high in, and so on in the digital abstraction chapter. So these pass transistors don't, don't exactly satisfy these constraints. And therefore, when you have long paths consisting of only these type of pass transistors, then you have to interleave them with inverters that do restore the signals well. And therefore, actually, the muxes become slower. It's a complicated issue. Comparing these two designs, it's highly technology dependent. It's beyond the scope of this course. Uh, what about the physical layout? You may ask in VLSI, I'm actually interested in the area that the circuit consumes, which uh, circuit has a smaller drawing. Again, this is beyond the scope of this course, so I will not focus on this. I want to conclude that our simplified cost and delay model cannot be used to deduce conclusively which of these two multiplexer designs is better. Both are asymptotically optimal, and that is good enough for us at this stage. Thank you very much.